how will supply chains cope with inventory disruption? My guest today is Richard Cabrera, Executive Vice President and Head of Middle Market Banking with Umqua Bank. Hello, Richard. Hello, Bob. Thanks for uh, spending the time with me. And this, of course, is a very critical issue now because inventory disruption is exactly what supply injuries are coping with now. I'd like to get a sense of uh, how you think this is going to affect them going forward, however. How will businesses need to be holding inventory or will they be needing to hold inventory for a longer time for the foreseeable future? Most definitely, Bob. Um, this, is, this is really a sea change that has taken place for, for so long. Companies had talked about just-in-time inventory management um, that was really predicated on a very deep supply chain, um, uh, multiple suppliers, uh, quick access to raw materials and finished product. That all changed during COVID. Um, and, and what we found were immediate supply disruptions. People got sick, production stopped, uh, the flow of material also stopped, and it left a number of companies, if not almost everybody in the supply chain, scrambling to make do. I think the lesson that was learned here was when everybody got healthy and back, that we need to have a better handle on our supply chain, our, our inventory suppliers, um, substitute products, where to acquire them, and to have more of them. And so mm -hmm. that change we can see across a variety of industries today. Companies are moving more toward not just having enough, but stockpiling inventory or raw materials or whatever product that they need today. And mm -hmm. that, that is taking place in large form. And they're taking possession of the inventory directly, are they, as opposed to in the uh, days of so-called vendor managed inventory, where the inventory would be there, but we pushed upstream. That's not the case anymore. It won't be the case. Well, it will be in some form, but 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 in, in many respects, companies want to handle their own destiny. Mm -hmm. I, I think what the, the, the pandemic showed us was that disruption it was of such magnitude that we really have to be responsible for ourselves. We want to touch, feel, know that we can stay in business, that we have our raw materials, that we have our inventory, that we have it close by, that that we we can look at our at our pipeline of, of sales and that we can provide our product. And so th that is really a, a, a phenomenon that, that we're observing today in the marketplace. Um, it, it, it's, it, it, in many respects, it's like a security blanket for a lot of companies. Sure. But then what are the financing implications of this, of this trend? Um, well, they're, they're varied. You know, obviously, in terms of working capital, it represents a much larger investment um, in inventory and in trading assets. So that's a big component that companies before the pandemic sought to minimize mm -hmm. through quick turns of inventory, effective inventory management and supply chain management. Today, you're starting to see this bulge in inventory. And it's just, it's really at the forefront because there, there, there's so much disruption that companies are getting what they can right now. But, but what we're being told is, is that we're gonna hold as much as three or four times the amount of inventory that we had. Wow. So, so if we could turn our inventory and, and you'd take an average manufacturing company, if we had 60 days of inventory, today we're going to have 240 or almost a year supply of inventory on hand over mm -hmm. time. So that means increased cost in working capital. Um, you've got to have a place to store that inventory. A lot of companies are acquiring uh, warehouses um, and utilizing them to store inventory. So there's financing that's involved in the acquisition of real estate or lease facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's financing involved in the equipment, equipment handling materials. So um, it, it really touches across a, a, a range of spectrum for the financing needs of a particular company. And what kind of pressure will that put on upstream suppliers too? Will they have to produce more product or sooner or earlier or ship it more? I mean, they're already under a lot of pressure getting slow paid by buyers already and they're having their own supply chain congestion problems. What might be the impact on suppliers? Well, I think it's, you know, nobody lives in a vacuum. And I think it's going to go through the entire ecosystem all, all, all the way through. And so in, in terms of um, if, if we are the first level of, of production and we had provided vendor financing in order to move our product, you're going to see less of that. And you're going to see more uh, conventional terms. And those people who have cash can get the product faster. And so, so our customers are saying we need increased lines of credit. 
Um, if it's if it's for inventory and if it's financing under a, a borrowing base, we need you to give us more uh, limits for inventory financing, higher advance rates, and we and, and and the biggest question that we need to answer is that we understand what is taking place from the banking industry perspective. Is that in any way related to, as I understand it, traditional banks seem to be moving away from trade financing over the years? I don't know if that's actually correct, but I had been hearing that, and a lot of non-bank sources were stepping in to take over. Is that the case? And if it is, are banks coming back to the picture now because of the opportunity? I think banks have traditionally been involved in working capital financing. I think that uh, some of our, our market share was eroded by vendor financing um, and a number of non-bank institutions that were in the supply chain um, financing. So that, that is still there, very present today. But for a conventional bank borrower who turns to the bank for working capital financing, for financing of fixed assets, that we're still very much in play. Um, and, and most importantly, there's a dynamic that is taking place where we're going to require more, not less financing. Yeah. You know, it seems so a lot of times that company executives are so short-sighted, they forget pretty quickly what happened in a, in a supply chain disruption. And I know COVID won't be forgotten quickly, but let's say it settles down for a while. And all of a sudden, these companies are saying, why are we sitting on all this inventory? Do you think they'll be smart enough to remember what happened and, and, and brave enough to hang on to it in, in, you know, in the case of future disruptions? I, I think so. I, I, think, I think this situation that I'm describing to you will last for the next, certainly for the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, after that, the mar markets become very efficient um, at, at supply flow. And what we're dealing with today is, is there, there's plenty of product. There's product that's available, but our supply flow is crimped. So the ports aren't working right now. They're backed up. I'm in Southern California, so the port of Long Beach and Los Angeles, we have 80 ships that are out on the water right now and can't even get in. But worse than that, you can't get the trucks in because you don't have truck drivers who are there to right. drive. There are 80,000 empty trucks today at this moment in time. So we can't, we can't move the material. And so this is um, an event that is so sizable and so impactful that I don't think it's gonna go away from memory in the short term, but in the long term, as markets become more efficient and um, the answer to known disruptions take place, I think it will moderate. It certainly shines a spotlight on the importance of the supply chain executive, doesn't it? The need for mastery of supply chain. I mean, that's gonna be something top of mind. It's got to be in boardrooms going forward. Absolutely. Um, it, it's, it's really um, your diversification in your supply base. It's knowing um, what's available as substitute product. And you're seeing a lot of that. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's an aspect of, hey, we, we had a lot of byproducts. I was reading an article today in the Wall Street Journal talking about um, um, a, a mineral product that was thrown away that could actually be used in the manufacturing of solar panel and semiconductor chips. Mm -hmm. So now um, there is now a recovery mode that is taking place. So all the way through the supply chain, um, we're taking a much deeper, harder look where there may have been waste or byproduct in the past. Okay, so what would you recommend say the first step for a supply chain executive who has never had to deal with the ebbs and flows of supply chain disruption, let's assuming that such an animal exists on the planet, or this is a person with not much experience, how should they start to move forward with this new way of thinking? Well, I would, I would, I would do an, uh, an assessment, an inventory assessment on your suppliers. Mm -hmm. I would understand, um, you know, their history. I would have a conversation with them about what their supply chain is. I'd have line of sight um, to what what's coming, um, so that you can then forecast. What your, what your needs are going to be if you can support your revenue. I, I think first and foremost, that, that is the discussion that, that a good supply chain manager should focus on. Richard Cabrera of Umqua Bank, thank you so much for sharing your insights about going forward, just what inventory policy is gonna to have to be like in the wake of this crisis and all future crises for that matter too. Great conversation. Thanks very much for being with me. Thanks, Bob. Great to be with you.